This is a 36th video supplement for CIS 351, Grand Valley State University's course on computer organization and assembly language. This video discusses how MIPS applies the make the common case fast design principle when handling large immediate values. Video 32 discussed the MIPS I type instruction. Instructions like this one that add the constant 6 to register T2. But remember, the immediate field in the instruction is only 16 bits. So what happens if that constant is larger than that? For example, how do we fit a 20-bit immediate value into a 16-bit field? Well, you don't. At least not directly. Let's consider several options. First, we could make every instruction longer. Let's think about what that might look like. What's the largest immediate value that makes sense? Well, since we have a 32-bit ALU, it's certainly reasonable to support a 32-bit immediate parameter. One way we could do this is by adding 16 bits to every instruction, thereby making all instructions 48 bits long. That would certainly be simple to implement, but it would mean that the R-type instructions would have a lot of unused bits. And today in 2021, memory accesses are one of the slowest aspects of computing. Therefore, if possible, we want to avoid spending time loading unused bits from RAM. And, as we'll see later in the semester, we also want to avoid storing those unused bits in the cache. So overall, this isn't a terrible idea, but let's see if we can do better. The second option would be to make only the I-type instructions 48 bits long, and to keep the other instructions at 32 bits. This would address the wasted memory concern, but it would add complexity to the CPU, because now the amount the program counter is incremented by would depend on the instruction which means the control unit would have to compute this value before we can increment the program counter. This isn't by any means a deal breaker. After all, many CPUs, including Intel x86 CPUs, have a variable width instruction set. But MIPS decided against it. This dependency on the control unit is a minor issue in the single cycle CPU, but can hinder the performance of a pipeline CPU, which we'll discuss later in the semester. So what does MIPS do? Well, first, recall that Patterson and Hennessy outlined four principles used to guide the design of the MIPS CPU. We're going to see how they applied the third principle, make the common case fast, when deciding how to handle large immediate values. Before getting into the details, I'm going to take a minute to introduce the concept of pseudo-instructions. When introducing assembly language back in video 33, I said that the key idea is for every line of assembly to correspond to one machine instruction and then an asterisk appeared. That's because assembly wasn't designed primarily to help students learn how CPUs work. It was designed to help programmers get code written. As a result, shortcuts have been introduced over time. Pseudo-instructions are one kind of shortcut. Consider, for example, setting a register to a value. When introducing assembly, I did this using an addI instruction. Specifically, adding the desired literal value to the zero register. However, if you're reading or writing a lot of code, it's nice to have a shortcut that more directly and concisely conveys the same idea. That's why MIPS has the load immediate pseudo instruction. Instead of having to type out the full add I instruction, I can load 6 into T0 this way. Now, look what happens when I assemble the code. The load immediate instruction becomes an unsigned add I. Remember that pseudo is Latin for false. Think of pseudopod in biology or pseudocode. LI is false in the sense that it doesn't represent an actual machine instruction. Instead, it's just a shortcut for entering the longer add I instruction. MIPS provides many pseudo instructions, and I'll point them out as we come across them. So now, watch what happens when I make the constant larger than 16 bits. I'm going to enter this constant in hex so it's easier to see what happens. Notice that when I assemble the code, this li is split into two machine instructions. Because the 32-bit constant 1234ABCD doesn't fit in the 16-bit immediate field, we have to split it up and load it in two pieces. The first instruction, LUI, stands for load upper immediate. This instruction loads its immediate parameter, hex 1234, into the upper bits of the target register. Notice that register 1 now contains the hex value 1234000. The or i instruction then computes the bitwise or of register 1 with the lower 16 bits of the original immediate value, the hex ABCD, 
and places the result into the desired destination, T0 in this case. Because LUI places zeros in the lower 16 bits, the ORI has the effect of just filling in the lower immediate bits into that target register, effectively reassembling the original 32-bit immediate value. Notice that the assembler chose register 1 as the destination for the LUI instruction. Register 1 is named AT, which stands for Assembler Temporary. By convention, this is the register that the assembler uses when it needs temporary space to implement a pseudo instruction. So when writing your own code, be sure to leave this register free for the assembler. Don't use it in the instructions you type. Otherwise, you might end up with a bug when your data gets clobbered. All right now, let's see what happens when we give add i a large immediate value. In this case, the add i pseudo instruction becomes three machine instructions. The first two are nearly identical to what we just saw for li. They split the immediate value into two pieces and load it into the at register. The third instruction then uses the r type add instruction to add the reconstructed value in at to the other source register. Notice that pseudo instructions and machine instructions can share names. For example, add i can either be a machine instruction or a pseudo instruction depending on the size of the immediate value. In this code here, the first add i with a 4-bit immediate is an actual machine instruction. Notice that the source and basic columns are nearly identical. The only thing that changed is that the register names got replaced with a number. In contrast, the second add i is a pseudo instruction. It got replaced by three machine instructions, the lui, the ori, and the add. So what does all of this have to do with making the common case fast? Well, think about the Java or C programs you've written. How often do you write lines of code that look like this as compared to this? I would expect that the small constants are much more common. The principle of making the common case fast says that we should focus on the speed of these common instructions, even if it means that the less common instructions are slower. Think back to our first two proposals for handling large constants either making all the instructions longer or allowing for a variable width instruction set. Both of these choices would make every instruction a little slower. Instead, the MIPS approach allows the common cases, like add i's with small constants, to complete as quickly as possible, but makes the uncommon cases take two or three entire CPU cycles. That means those add i's with large constants are considerably slower than the alternative for those specific instructions, but the situation is rare enough that it allows the CPU to run faster overall. Consider this hypothetical example. Suppose we have a 1 gigahertz single cycle CPU that uses a fixed width instruction set, which is what we've been building thus far. Also assume that 1 tenth of 1% of the instructions have large immediate values. If we assume that each instruction takes exactly one cycle, then it takes one second to run 1 billion instructions. Of course, we can't quite reach this ideal because we need some way of handling those large immediate values. So let's consider two alternatives. First, suppose that if we switch to a variable width instruction set, the critical path would grow slightly and we'd have to slow the clock by 1%. In this case, it would take 1.01 seconds to run the 1 billion instructions. Or, if we take the MIPS approach and replace each instruction that has a large immediate value with a pseudo instruction that requires three real instructions, then our CPU will only need 1.002 seconds to run 1 billion instructions. By maintaining the speed of the common instructions, even at the expense of the less common instructions, we ended up with a faster CPU overall. Let me explain more carefully where I got the 1.002 second figure from. I assume that one-tenth of one percent of the one billion instructions have large immediate values and must be replaced by pseudo instructions. That means there are 999 million real instructions and one million pseudo instructions. Each of the 999 million real instructions corresponds to exactly one line of machine code and requires one cycle to run. The remaining 1 million pseudo instructions correspond to three lines of machine code each for a total of 3 million additional machine instructions. This produces a total of 1 billion 2 million machine instructions. If we run 1 billion 2 million cycles at 1 billion cycles per second, we get an execution time of 1.002 seconds. 
Of course, the challenge when performing this type of analysis is to accurately estimate the percentage of instructions with large immediate values. We'll leave that discussion for a future video. The splitting of ADI into multiple lines of machine code is just one of several ways that the MIPS processor applies the principle of making the common case fast. I'll point out more in future videos as we add features to the CPU. OK, let's summarize. Our CPU needs a way to support those immediate values with lengths between 16 and 32 bits. Remember, this isn't trivial because the I-type instruction format only has room for a 16-bit immediate. In this video, we discussed three options. One, making all instructions 48 bits long. Two, switching to a variable width instruction set and allowing the I-type and R-type instruction formats to have a different number of bits. Or three, splitting instructions with large immediate values into several instructions. MIPS chose the third option because the first two would necessitate a longer clock, thereby slowing every instruction down. Option three only slows down those few instructions with large immediate values. This is an example of the make the common case fast design principle. We also discuss pseudo instructions. These are instructions that are recognized by the assembler, but don't correspond to actual machine instructions. Their purpose is to simplify the writing of assembly code. And remember, pseudo instructions may correspond to one machine instruction or possibly more than one machine instruction. Now, by the time of our next exam, you should be able to explain how the MIPS CPU applies the make the common case fast design principle, not only in the case of large immediate values like we discussed here, but also other examples that you'll encounter in the next few videos. You should also be able to recognize whether a MIPS assembly instruction corresponds to a real machine instruction or if it's a pseudo instruction. And if given a pseudo instruction, be able to explain or at least have a reasonable guess as to why it's a pseudo instruction. In other words, be able to speculate as to why the MIPS designers didn't implement this pseudo instruction as an actual machine instruction. And finally, to remind you again, as you watch the next several videos, keep an eye out for other applications of the four design principles as well as other pseudo instructions. I may ask about them on a future exam.